So with 11 days into September, the format's still stale as shit, there's no new products being released, and the 200th YCS, the biggest event of all time, is happening in less than two weeks. But hey, no sooner than August, right? What's going on guys, it's Simo, and yes I know, I'm bringing you another ban list related video, probably gonna be more so a rant than an actual video, but I feel like this is important to do a little bit of a retrospective on the ban list, and kind of discuss how the ban list got to the point where it is now, and kind of analyze, is this a working system? Because frankly, I think there's a lot of issues currently going on with the ban list that we need to discuss, and that's what I felt like talking about today. But before we do, just big shout outs to my newest YouTube channel, members as always. So big shout out today to David and Kayo. You guys are the reason that this channel is growing strong. And if you guys want to help support me in the channel through a YouTube channel membership, hit the join button down below or check out the links in the description. But without further ado, let's go ahead and get right into it. So the way the ban list started out was it was on a cycle of about every six months, at least I think. It's been a very long time, but I think we had a ban list coming out about every six months. Now, you guys have to realize that back then, Yu-Gi-Oh! was a very different beast because there wasn't as many products being injected into the game as there are now. The game wasn't, you know, in a state where there really needed to be a lot of changes. Yes, there were some incredibly powerful and broken cards, but again, you have to look at it in context of the time where, you know, now we've got some just absolutely absurd combos and cards, where back then, a card's power level is really good in the context of, like, that time, but compared to now, it's not nearly as good. Fast forward a little bit, though, and we actually started getting ban lists every three to four months, and this was a pretty drastic change, but it was a change that a lot of people really liked because we were getting lists a lot more frequently, and this is kind of going with the evolution of power creep and kind of just seeing how the game was evolving, becoming at a much more rapid pace, which obviously if you've played the game for any span of time, you know power creep is inevitable. So going to this three-month system was very good, and the best part about the three-month system is that we knew when the next list was going to come out. We were basically getting them every three months on the first of the month or relatively like the beginning of the month, but it always stated that here's your new list, the next list will come out three months from now on X date. And this is really nice, so much so that they actually started writing articles about it and kind of how the player base was receptive to it. This is an article I'm gonna be citing that was written on July 2nd, 2015 on the Yu-Gi-Oh! Konami blog, and I'll have a link to this in the description below in case you want to read the full thing. Response to the more rapid three-month list changes has been good, and we think that's because it gives us more flexibility in adjusting the list, addressing the needs of the players, and making a game that's more fun for everyone. Flexibility is good. I want you guys to burn this into your brain for the remainder of this discussion because the three main points here are flexibility is good, they want to adjust the list basically to adapt to the needs of the players, and adjust the list to make a game that's more fun for everyone. So with that in mind, we are now at a point where we no longer receive three month lists. We don't know when they're gonna update the list because they decided to remove that end date and that kind of frustrated a lot of the player base. Before when we had those three month lists, it was very beneficial for players playing at a competitive level because they knew that, oh, if there's an event coming up, let's say for instance there's an event in, oh, I don't know, the end of September and we knew that the next ban list wasn't going to come out until October 1st, well, there's no mystery as to what the format's going to be, so players can safely prepare for that event under the current format with the current card pool and know what to expect. There was also the fact that you could invest in the cards knowing that this is going to be the duration for how long these cards are playable, and if you want to sell them off before the list comes out, you have the opportunity to do so in case they're cards that might potentially get hit. So from a secondary market and just from an overall player perspective, especially if you're someone playing on a budget and really wants to be cost effective with how you're purchasing your cards, it was extremely beneficial to have this three-month system in place 
and just made it just overall good for everyone. But then they stripped away that end date and that's where things started to get a lot more complicated. Now, in theory, stripping away the end date makes a lot of sense and I'm gonna go ahead and cite the article one more time. But having specific dates was running contrary to that because hard quote, this list will end on date X, end quote, lines were limiting our flexibility. Sometimes we felt that we had to hit a card because it might become a problem rather than because it was a problem. This is good practice sometimes, but not always. And occasionally we ended up being a little heavy handed with players wondering why they did that. Now this is really important because again, Flexibility in theory sounds good. If they don't have a list, then theoretically they can update the list, you know, after a month, after a couple months, they can adjust the list as needed depending on what's happening. But theory is good, but did they put that into practice? Not really, and to perfectly exemplify that, look at the past year worth of Yu-Gi-Oh! I mean, we had a tier zero spiral format that lasted multiple YCSs. Granted, they hit it pretty much immediately after both of those events took place, but honestly, the damage had already been done and full power tier zero spiral was taking up like 27 and 29 spots respectively at both YCS Dallas, and I believe it was YCS London, I'm not too sure, but it was one of the YCSs that took place uh, in the European Union. Then you have the fact that when you moved on from that, Spiral was still a very strong contender, and then once they finally put Spiral in check, it gave rise to the Pendulum FDK. And how long did we deal with the Pendulum FDK in our format? It was about like three to four fucking months that we had to deal with Pendulum FDK, but even beyond Pendulum FDK, there was also Gem Knight FDK, which was another very viable like tier two deck that you could bring to a YCS. And I know this is a little bit opinionated, but I personally do not feel that FDK decks should exist, especially at the highest tiers of competitive play. This is an interactive trading card game and an FDK of playing solitaire really should have no place. But even when they finally did deal with Pendulum FDK, guess what came along? Goki. And while Goki isn't necessarily an FDK, by establishing an extra link, especially in tandem with Trigate Wizard and all the different Nightmare cards released in Flames of Destruction, it was basically like the same fucking thing because there's no way you're going to be able to out that board unless you have very specific outs. And even sometimes they can go into Gumblar and remove all the outs out of your hand so it didn't even matter if you drew your outs because Gumblar is going to rip them out of your hand anyway. There are so many different ways to pretty much manipulate that extra link into one player's favor that if you didn't open a hand trap and they just opened two cards out of like the 30 cards in their deck that started the combo, well, you just lost the game. Might as well go to game two. So yes, flexibility is good, but if they wanted more flexibility, why didn't any of these issues get addressed with any amount of expediency? I will give them a little credit. I guess they hit Spiral relatively fast. I mean, it only lasted two events and both of those events took place on one weekend after another. So it was really only legal for a couple of weeks. But even then the damage had kind of already been done, especially for those two YCSs. And it really kind of left a sour taste in the player base's mouth. But even when you move on to Pendulum FTK, again, why was this allowed for four months? They could have easily addressed this just like they did on the ban list that finally did, but it kind of took them a while to do it, don't you think? I think one of the things is that maybe it didn't have the same results as something like Tier Zero Spiral did, where it wasn't taking up 27 or 29 of the top slots, so they didn't really consider it as that large of a threat, even though it was just taking up a majority of the slots in top cut regardless. Same thing kind of goes for Goki, you know, Goki has that same level of power, but just because it's not taking up 27, 28, 29 spots of a top 32 cut, I guess apparently in their eyes, that's something that's okay because technically other decks are still able to compete, but that doesn't justify the fact that these other decks are problematic and need to be addressed. In addition to that, 
Because there's no end date on these ban lists, people don't know if they're going to a particular event, whether or not it's going to be under a new format. And I think especially like, look at the 200th YCS as an example of this. We're two weeks away from it at the time of recording this video, less than that actually. We still don't have a ban list. We don't know if we're gonna get one. And this is really doing a disservice to the player base because even if a list does come out, let's say at the beginning of next week, players are only going to have one week to be able to figure out what decks are good and there's going to be players that are still figuring it out there might be a lot of misplays some people might attribute that to part of the skill of the game in figuring out what the best deck is in a short amount of time but I would rather it be the opposite where we have a lot of time, maybe let's say two or three weeks in an ideal situation. Players can take the time, test these decks at their locals, their regionals, whatever, and then we can actually start to figure out a format. And I think that makes for a lot better Yu-Gi-Oh because then you're gonna have players playing at a much higher level. It's not gonna go down to misplays. It's not gonna go down to misjudgments. There's so much more skill involved once things start to get figured out rather than the massive frenzy of people just kind of frantically throwing stuff together and seeing if it'll stick. One thing that perplexed me is that after we had the North American WCQ and all of the World Championship qualifiers take place, why didn't we just get a ban list like immediately after that? Because the format had already been the same since that point. There's only been a couple new products that have come out. There was what, Shadows in Valhalla and the Megatins. And honestly, both of these products really aren't gonna have an impact on the ban list in any way, shape or form. Firewall Dragon being like the only potential card that could be there. So I think the biggest problems when it comes to the ban list, frankly, are greed and the lack of communication. The reason I say greed is that I think the reason the list didn't come out prior to the Megatins is that they honestly wanted to sell their Megatins. And yeah, there's not really any targets in there for the ban list, at least in my opinion, outside of Firewall Dragon. But even if it's in there, it's not like they haven't done this before. Look at the 2017 Megatins. They had all the good Zodiac monsters in there like Dryden and Broadbull. And what happened? They sold their Megatins and two or three weeks later, Dryden and Broadbull got banned. And it was kind of just a quick cash grab because at the time, Zodiac was actually really expensive because they were secret rares and Raging Tempest. And the prices of them literally crashed because people knew that they were gonna get banned. That's how powerful they were. But Konami went ahead, printed them in the Megatins. People bought up the Megatins and then they banned the deck two or three weeks later. Pretty nice, right? But I think the bigger issue is, is the lack of communication here. If we actually were getting informed updates about here's where the format is, we see that this is a problem, we're seeing that we're gonna adjust it, or if they were actually practicing what they preached and actually adjusted the format when it needs to be adjusted, then that might start to instill a lot of confidence in the player base because right now there's such a wide chasm between Konami and the player base as is and there's so much disdain and frustration there that I feel like by having that communication with the player base and letting everyone know, hey, we see that there's an issue here with this FDK or with this deck or whatever, even just making a simple article like they did when they went from three month ban lists to not having end dates at all. The communication can at least help, you know, start to build confidence in the player base that there's going to be something happening rather than just leaving us in purgatory, which is kind of what it feels like right now because we know this format is bad. A lot of people are sick of it and we're just kind of waiting, you know, until they hit stuff. We just don't know when. So until then, we just have to suffer playing through this format and a lot of people aren't exactly happy with that. I really hope that there is an increase in communication and I feel like communication is really key with a lot of these things and yeah sure there's still always going to be people that are going to be upset with certain decisions but at least if we're communicating with one another then that's going to help make things a lot easier and might make the game a lot better as a whole. Maybe I'm idealistic, but I like to think that there is still some hope. But guys, those are just my thoughts. Let me know down in the comments what you guys think about the current state of the ban list and kind of where we're at as a whole when it comes to how the ban list is presented to us. I'd really love to hear your thoughts. Thank you so much for watching the video. Be sure to like the video as always. Subscribe to the channel for more amazing Yu-Gi-Oh! content. And if you found this video informative, consider becoming a YouTube channel member because just by supporting an any way that you can, you're investing in my ability to continue bringing you amazing Yu-Gi-Oh! content. So thanks so much again, and we'll see you next time.